Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly accomplished playwright, director, producer, and author who last appeared on our show to discuss his wonderful memoir, Just Outside the Spotlight, Growing Up with Eileen Heckert, which I've said before, and I'll say again, is the best celebrity memoir I've ever read. Our guest studied at the Juilliard School of Drama, NYU, Circle in the Square, and Northwestern, and he holds a Master's of Fine Arts degree in playwriting and screenwriting from the University of California, Riverside. He's written many critically acclaimed plays that have been produced all over the country, including A Place at Forest Lawn, The Lavender Mafia, The Man Who Killed the Cure, The Last Lifeboat, and my favorite, Marilyn, Mom, and Me, which won the prestigious Stanley Award for Drama this year. Our guest has been the assistant director for six Broadway plays, and he's directed and produced off-Broadway and at regional theaters throughout the country and abroad. He served as the producing artistic director of the Long Beach Civic Light Opera in California and the Struthers Library Theater in Pennsylvania. He's also a highly sought after guest director and he teaches playwriting at California State Fullerton and Chapman University. He's here to discuss his brand new book entitled The Art of Writing for the Theater, an introduction to script analysis, criticism and playwriting. The book provides practical advice for aspiring playwrights and theater critics. In addition to the wealth of instructive material, the book contains fascinating pearls of wisdom from interviews the author conducted with 18 internationally acclaimed playwrights, lyricists, librettists, and critics. The book is rapidly becoming required reading in university theater courses, but as you're about to find out, the book is of interest not only to those aspiring to write for the theater, but to every theater lover, because it provides illuminating insights into the creative process. I'm delighted to welcome my good friend, Luke Yankee, back to our show. Luke, thank you so much for being here. Harvey, it's always a pleasure to see you and to be here. Thank you. Luke, you went to your first Broadway play when you were nine years old, and you said that something deep inside you told you that the theater would be your life. What was it about seeing a live play on stage that captivated you so much? You know, it's... It's hard to say, Harvey. It, it, it's almost actually hard to put into words. And as a writer, I'm rarely at a loss for words. But there was just this sort of this magic, this kind of essence of something, especially since it was the opening night of a Broadway show, something that you knew would never happen again. And it it just transported me and took me to a world that I knew I wanted to be in in some fashion or, or another for the rest of my life. So what inspires you to write the book? Well, I've been teaching for uh, five years at Cal State Fullerton and at Chapman University. And one of my colleagues, a brilliant man of the theater named Jim Voles, approached me and said that he was the editor for this series uh, called Introductions to Theater. And he said, Luke, we've been looking for someone with just your skill set to write an introductory text to script analysis, playwriting, and theater criticism. And one of the things that I was fascinated to learn, Harvey, in my research is that there's actually not a great deal written in particular about theater criticism. There's, there are a lot of collections of critics with famous critics like Walter Kerr and Rex Reed for films and that sort of thing, but there isn't a, a lot written about how to actually do it. So because it was during the pandemic, uh, it was kind of a perfect time to take on this project. You spent a lot of years as an actor, playwright and director. What made you decide to also become a teacher? As you know, and as we talked about the last time I was on the show, I grew up in a theatrical household. My mother was an actress named Eileen Heckert, who won an Academy Award for the film Butterflies Are Free and is in the Theater Hall of Fame. And as a result of, of growing up in that rather privileged world, I feel like I was given so many gifts about acting and about the theater, everything from how to give a nuanced performance to how to take a curtain call from a very early age. And I've always felt a tremendous responsibility to pass that on. 
And so even though, as you said, I've been acting, directing, writing for many, many years, I've always taught in between my other projects. And about seven years ago, I went back and got my master's degree because I wanted to be able to do it in a more formal way. And since then, I haven't stopped working. Luke, you gave an excellent summary of Aristotle's poetics and his definition of tragedy, which is an imitation of an action which has serious and far-reaching consequences. And he said that plot was primary over character. Do you think the definition of tragedy has evolved over the years? One of the interesting things about Aristotle's poetics, and I talk about this in the book because it is such a foundation, it's kind of amazing to me that we are still using this as the foundation for so many theater courses, and especially for script analysis, thousands of years later. And when I was conducting the interviews for the book, Harvey, one of the things that I did was I asked all of these extraordinary playwrights and critics and librettists, but particularly the playwrights, what they considered more important, character or plot. And just about all of them said that they felt it was sort of like the chicken or the egg, that you can't have a strong plot without having rich characters and vice versa. So while some of them maybe lean more towards one than the other, it, it was fascinating to me to, and, and I'm sure we'll talk more about that, to interview these extraordinary writers. And, and every one of those was like a masterclass for me. Luke, I'm fascinated by the fact that it's possible to see two versions of the same play directed by two different directors, and yet they're so very different. This happens a lot with Shakespeare plays. How do you assess whether an innovative interpretation of a play is in keeping with the playwright's intentions? Well, that's a wonderful question. And there are times when, uh, as a playwright myself, I've seen some productions of some of my plays where <laughs> I just wanted to make a Home Alone face. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I've seen some wonderful ones as well. But when one knows a play like Shakespeare or like a classic, it, it's much more easy to have a sense of what the playwright intended, uh, even though I wasn't around to ask Shakespeare or Ibsen or Chekhov what they thought of their plays. But with a contemporary play, it's more difficult because you don't know how much the director has imposed and of course, you know, one sees uh, just by way of example and, and something that, of course, most people in your audience will know, Romeo and Juliet, for instance. There have been productions of that that have been set, say, in during the Civil War, where you have the women in hoop skirts and the men in, in their uh, Confederate uh, uh, and their Union uniforms. And something like that, when something like that is imposed on a play, it can work. I saw a production years ago of Henry V, where the director, who shall remain nameless, a very famous director, his metaphor was that war is a game. So he had all of the actors in modern day variations on hockey uniforms and football uniforms, and it was just a disaster. <laughs> he was imposing something on the play that you're taking one concept and as opposed to with the Romeo and Juliet thing, taking an overall concept and uh, applying it. But he was taking one element and it, it sort of fell apart. So if a person has a compelling story to tell, how do they decide whether to write a novel, a screenplay or a play? That's a great question. Really, it comes down to individual choice. And one of the things that I talk about in the book is that obviously, since I'm talking about it from the standpoint of playwriting, you know something is a play if it's dialogue driven. If it's visually motivated, then it's a screenplay. If it has long flowery descriptive passages about the weather and the shape of the coffee cup, then it's probably a novel. But one of the things that, uh, as I've been teaching playwriting, is that sometimes one of my students will write a play that has car chases and explosions. And I'll say, you know, this really isn't a play. One of my mentors, 
a brilliant, brilliant playwright, has a play that is very well written, but it has a flying car in it, uh, sort of a la Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And, you know, God bless him, he hasn't gotten that play produced very much because the flying car is of vital importance to the script, and that's just too expensive to do on stage. So one of the things when I interviewed uh, Beth Henley, who created uh, Crimes of the Heart and the Miss Firecracker Contest and so many brilliant plays, is that one of the things she said is that when she originally wrote uh, Crimes of the Heart, the final scene takes place at a birthday party. And it's these, these very eccentric Southern women, which is sort of what she specializes in because she's from that background. And the final scene is a birthday party. And she intentionally wrote the script that they didn't cut the cake because she knew it would be more expensive to produce it in a small theater if they had to have an actual cake every night. <laughs> and of course, when it was done on Broadway in the final scene, they're all shoving big slabs of cake into their mouth in the final scene. But, but when she did it originally, she just thought, well, no, I've, I've got to produce this economically. And, uh, and if they actually cut the cake and eat it, that may be too expensive and that may hurt my chances of getting it produced. Luke, you told a wonderful story in the book about your dear mom, the fabulous Eileen Heckert, actually getting Arthur Miller to change a line in a play she was starring in. That yes. was an incredibly gutsy thing for her to do. And I'm wondering, what should an actor consider before ever doing that? Uh, that's a wonderful question, and I, I feel like I need to kind of tell the story to set it up. So my mother was cast in uh, Arthur Miller's A View from the Bridge, which has gone on to become a, a classic and an iconic play of the American theater. And this was after Arthur Miller had done Death of a Salesman, and he was very much the flavor of the month in the theater community. I mean, he was the hottest playwright in America and probably one of the hottest playwrights in the world at this time. And Martin Ritt was the director and who went on to do films like Norma Ray and a very important Hollywood director, but he was directing the play. And so one day in rehearsal, and as is often the case, uh, the, the playwright was also sitting in on rehearsals and, you know, just sort of giving it his stamp of approval. So my mother went to Martin Ritt and said, uh, Marty, uh, this line on page 47, I, I just don't think Beatrice would say that. It, it doesn't feel right to me. And he said, well, what do you want me to do about it? And she said, well, Arthur's here today, and I, I'd like you to ask him if we can change the line. And he said, you can't ask Arthur Miller to change a line. And she said, watch me. And so she starts walking up to the back of the theater where Arthur's sitting. And as she's walking up the aisle, she's getting more and more nervous, thinking, Arthur's such a gentle, kind man, and I don't want to offend him. And, and what if Martin Ritt was right, and he's going to be very upset about this, and I'll, I'll ruin my relationship with this important playwright. And, and so she's terribly nervous by the time she gets to the back of the theater. And, and she's like, uh, 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 Arthur, could, could I speak to you for a second? And he moves his things and she sits down next to him and she says, well, about th this line on page 47, it, it just doesn't feel natural to me. And, and I, I was just, I wanted to know what you thought of it. And he looked a little taken aback because people didn't speak that way to Arthur Miller. And so she put the script in front of him and he looks at it and he says, fine, what would you like to stay, say instead? And I love that story because I think it says so much, first of all, about the fact that the playwright knew, and as experienced as he was at that point, Arthur Miller had enough of a sense to know that an actress who was really living the role and playing it, you know, working on it day after day after day, in, may have better instincts about the character than he did at that stage of the game. And also it shows what a brilliant collaborator he was. The fact that he had no ego about it. He was like, okay, great, let's change the line. So I, but if when one is in that situation, there are some playwrights, there's a wonderful expression where they say, you mustn't be afraid to kill your darlings. Meaning if there is a line that you, as a playwright that you're absolutely in love with or a scene that you just can't live without, when you get into rehearsal and you realize this just isn't working or this line is, you know, bogging down the scene, you, you know, you, you have to be willing to cut it. So, and some playwrights, 
some writers of any genre really are just so adamant about nobody touches a line of mine and you 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 can't cut a line and uh, but i think the the more experienced playwrights are the ones that are able to say as arthur miller did that's if it's not working well, let's change it now you were talking about your friend the playwright who had a cake in the last scene that she deliberately had people not cut to keep the expenses down. Is that what you were talking about when you said in the book that a good playwright should think like a producer or director when they're writing? Yes, definitely. And and as Beth Henley you know, won the Pulitzer Prize for Crimes of the Heart, as she did with The Cake, I think one of the things that has helped me as a playwright, Harvey, is the fact that I've been a director for so many years. So I have a a theatrical sense of what's going to work and what isn't. As I mentioned earlier, my friend who writes plays with flying cars and has a hard time getting them produced, I think it's really important because one of the things that is really difficult for playwrights in this day and age is if you have a play with a cast of more than six, it is going to be very difficult to get it produced in a professional theater. And that just has to do with economics, because you have to have understudies and you have to have health insurance and you have to have, you know, union uh, actors equity union rates. So one has to keep all of those things in mind. And a lot of times when one applies to playwriting competitions or festivals or that sort of thing, they specifically say, do not submit your script if the cast is more than six because it just it becomes too difficult for them to produce it. And so that puts certain constraints on the playwright. In fact, I have a play with a cast of, it's called The Last Lifeboat, and it's about the aftermath of the sinking of the Titanic. Production just opened last night, uh, just outside of Chicago. And as of today, it has had 56 productions around the country in North America. And I'm very proud of that. And while I'm not poo-pooing this, those have all been amateur productions. They've either, either been community theaters or colleges or something along those lines because it has a flexible cast, but the minimum number of actors you can really do it with because it's the story of the sinking of the Titanic is 13. So much as I would love to have a professional production of this play, it's just the cast is too big. Whereas schools and colleges are commu and community theaters are looking for things with bigger casts. So you, when I say that uh, a playwright needs to think like a producer, it depends on where you wanna get your work produced. So if you're writing for community theaters, if you're writing for schools and that sort of thing, great, write plays with big casts. If you're writing for the commercial theater, you need to think about smaller casts, otherwise, it's just too expensive and it's too it's not economically viable. And I would imagine that applies not only to the cost of a cast size, but special effects, number of sets. Definitely. That all affects whether a theater can afford to mount your play. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, unless you have big Disney budgets or something like that, which not many theaters do have un unless you're uh, lucky enough to be on Broadway or something like that, doing something like Lion King or uh, Aladdin. But those are the exception to the rule. So Luke, how important is it for a playwright to read and see other people's plays? I think it's vital. I think I one of the things that I tell young playwrights is see as much as you can, read as much as you can. Now there are so many online resources in terms of things like the, the National Theatre from uh, London and, and they have wonderful plays or Broadway HD where they have so many Broadway plays and you can download a subscription to that for I think something like $9 a month, you know? And I think it's, it's vitally important. And also reading other plays and also as I mentioned earlier, with these interviews I conducted, one of the things that was so valuable for me with in interviewing these 18 world-class writers is that there was, there was very little ego involved. Most of them were incredibly humble and 
I mean, these were just about all people who have won the Pulitzer Prize or the Tony, or even in some cases, the Academy Award and, uh, or all of the above. And just about all of them had a sense of, if I can do it, you can do it, which was incredibly liberating for me and is something I've tried to pass on to my readers in the book. You said that every play should ask a question. What did you mean by that? One of the things that Marcia Norman, the brilliant Pulitzer Prize winner for Night Mother, says that in, in a full length play, within the first eight to 10 pages of the play, you need to let the audience know when we get to go home. And basically what she means by that is within the first eight to 10 pages, and she's quite scientific about it, saying it must be within the first eight pages, is that you need to let the audience know what the main conflict is, what, what are we fighting for here? What are we rooting for? And when this situation is resolved, that's when we get to go home. She has a brilliant play, as I mentioned earlier, called Night Mother, a devastatingly powerful play that was then done as a film as well with Sissy Spacek and Anne Bancroft about a, a young woman, basically, who comes in and says to her mother, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically saying that we are going to spend a lovely evening together. I'm going to fill your pill bottles. I'm going to be sure there's cookie in the cookies in the cookie jar. And then at the end of the evening, I'm going to take daddy's revolver and I'm going to say night mother. And I'm going to go up to my bedroom and I'm going to stick the revolver in my mouth. And that happens within the first five minutes of the play. So by example, you know that when she goes upstairs and pulls that trigger or not, that's when we get to go home. So again, it's asking a question, it's making a statement, but also what, what is this play about? What is the main conflict? Luke, I wanna ask you about criticism. There was a time when critics could make or break a show because their opinions carried so much weight. Now, Anyone can write a blog online, even anonymously, and call themselves a critic. And I'm sure people read reviews online more than they read reviews in print. Do you think criticism and reviews are as important today in the theater world as they used to be before the internet? I don't think they're as important today, but I still think they're vitally important. Because for instance, if let's just say a couple is doing an evening on Broadway, and they've saved up for it and you know, they're going in to see that big Broadway musical or, or that very funny new comedy. So they've got the cost of the theater tickets, which are very expensive. They've got the cost maybe of a babysitter, of dinner out, driving into the city, et cetera, all of that. So they want to be damn sure that they're going to like what they're going to see. So. I think in that sense, critics are still important. But again, now that anyone can call themselves a critic and start a blog, as you said, I think they are less so, but there's also a wider net in that, I mean, people may listen to an online critic who's someone they particularly like, even if they really don't have any credentials. But one of the things that I talk about in the book too is when one goes to the theater with what I call a civilian, someone who is not in the theater. So in other words, a theater person go, or, or a film student or something going to a play or a film with someone who is not of that world. It's very important that you don't ruin the experience for them. One of the things that it brings to mind is if you tell a really fabulous joke to a stand-up comic, they'll go, that's funny. That's really funny. Because they're analyzing the joke. They're thinking, what makes this funny? What makes this work? And in the same way, I've gone to uh, comedies with friends and they'll say, Luke, you didn't laugh once. And I say, oh, I really enjoyed it, but I was analyzing the play and, and really kind of studying it and what made it work, et cetera. I have a friend out in, 
And she's someone we both know, so I'm not going to say her name. She's an actress. And friends of hers who are not in the theater went to see a play and they said, oh, we, we just love that play in such and such theater the other night. And she got really indignant and said, okay, let me tell you why you shouldn't have liked that play. And she totally ruined the experience for them. And sometimes, especially when one is a theater student or a film student or a playwriting student, there's that sense of when you go to the theater or the film or something or a concert or whatever with someone who is not of that world, there is that tendency to go, let me tell you how much I know. Let me tell you how smart I am and let me, but so I think a much better way to do it is even if you hated it, you say to the other person, so what did you think of it? And then let them give their opinion first. And if they loved it and you hated it, keep your mouth shut. Let them have their experience of the play because not only will they be thinking, oh, well, gee, they're the professional and I, I guess I really don't know. Not only will it make them feel bad, it, it, you might have just destroyed a future audience member. Why would this person ever want to go to the theater again? Because they'll think, oh, well, I'm ignorant and I really don't know very much. So maybe I just won't go. That's a very good point. Now, Luke, my favorite part of your book are the interviews with superstars like Sheldon Harnick, Charles Bush, David Lindsay Abair, and many others. You filmed these interviews and I want to show our audience a brief clip of highlights from those interviews. Watch this. What do you love about the theater? I love the bargain we make between the audience and the theater makers. We're going to create the world here. We want you to pretend it's real. I love theater because, like, objectively speaking, it's kind of ridiculous. Whatever you're writing about, it's coming organically from something inside of you. Whether this happened in your life, maybe not, but the emotions and concerns are real. Those come from you. The thing that makes you unique, that makes you idiosyncratic, that makes you weird, that's your superpower as a writer. You know, all kinds of stories begin with one person that wants one thing. The best theater character and story are seamlessly woven together throughout the play. Ideally, it becomes more complex as it goes along. So the line is authentic to that character, but it wasn't quite what I expected. I think the audience member pricks up their ears and, and listens, becomes an active participant. You shouldn't be able to tell what came first. Lyrics first, music first. If it's done right, it should be seamless. You wouldn't know it when music came first or the lyric first. You learn to write. You have to sit down. And if you sit down and you stay down long enough, something will happen. As playwrights, I think we still believe in the power of magic because I think words can still have such an impact. They can shift and transform not only how we think, but then history in the making. There's a magic in that. Where can people see the videos of the full interviews? They actually, the full interviews are not available at this point. I have posted a few clips as sort of teasers on my Facebook page, but I am in the process of creating uh, an online course. And that's going to be kind of the next logical progression from the book. But I'm very excited to be creating an online course where 
I will be talking about the how-to elements. And then, for instance, I will say, and here is Pulitzer Prize winner Marsha Norman talking about the art of collaboration and how she created the libretto for The Color Purple. And then I'll have an excerpt of Marsha Norman talking about the nature of collaboration. But that is going to be the next step. And I'm very excited about that. It's with, with the many different hats I'm wearing at the moment, that might be a little bit down the line, but that is definitely something that is in the works. Oh, I think it's a fabulous idea. And I think those interviews are really going to enhance the experience of taking the course. You know, Luke, I was absolutely fascinated by some of the things people said in your interviews. For example, so many writers, including people who've won Tonys, Oscars, and Pulitzers, say that they have imposter syndrome. Why do you think that is? Well, you know, it's one of the things that I ask them, and Harvey, I think it's such a common thing for most of us. There's this wonderful scene in the play, The Real Thing by Tom Stoppard, where a very seasoned actress is on the train up to do a play in Scotland. And one of the young actors says, uh, she's talking about how nervous she is. And one of the young actors says to her, well, why, why would you be nervous? You, you, you won all these awards and you're such a brilliant actress. And she said, every time I start a rehearsal, I say to myself, this is the one where I get found out. But I think that sort of imposter syndrome is something we all suffer from. I heard, I can't remember if it was Barbara Walters or if it was Oprah Winfrey, or maybe they both said it in one form or another, but you know, these powerful women who have, and these people who have interviewed every major figure of the 20th century. And they, I've heard them say that after the interview, I mean, kings, queens, incredible leaders, uh, Oscar winners, they would turn to her after the camera stopped and they went, was I all right? Was that okay? I, I didn't give a bad interview, did I? And I'm sure as an interviewer you said yourself, you've experienced that also. All the time. It, it's that imposter syndrome that I think we all have. But But it was really very comforting and reassuring to me that these Tony winners, these Pulitzer Prize winners all said, yeah, I feel like a fraud. And one of the things that I said was, I mentioned Beth Henley earlier, who won the Pulitzer Prize when she was very young for Crimes of the Heart. I believe it was one of her very first plays. And I said to her, a very sweet, shy, self-effacing woman, and a lovely, lovely person, so gentle and kind. And I said to her, you know, Beth, in recent years, you've been writing in all of these different styles. And I'm curious what that is about. Are, are you trying to uh, broaden your horizons or, or strengthen your skills? And she said, no, I'm trying to become a good writer. And I said, wow. excuse me? She said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to write. And I said, you've won the Pulitzer You've been nominated for several Tonys. You won one. You, you, you're trying to become a good writer? She's like, yeah. So wow. that, I, I think that kind of says it all. And when I asked everyone about that imposter syndrome, every one of them, the head of playwriting at Yale, Donald Margulies, who's also won the Pulitzer, David Lindsay Abair, who is the hottest playwright, one of the hottest writers in New York at the moment, so many others, they're like, oh, I feel like a total fraud. Absolutely, every day. It's nice to know I don't feel alone. <laughs> Nor I. I asked you about criticism a few minutes ago in one of your interviews, Peter Felici has said that theater reviews are technically obsolete the moment they're written. Do you agree? To some extent, yes. And I think counter to what I said earlier about how certain people look to them for guidance. But I think what Peter meant by that was that because a live performance is so much of the moment, and if you go see the same play several times, you'll see little nuances, you'll see different things, even if it's the exact same cast and the exact same production. So I think what he was really saying is that that sort of magic that I was talking about, that I experienced when I was a little boy, the immediacy of the theater is something that cannot ever be replaced. Did your mom read her reviews? She did. 
I know a lot of actors who don't. Florence Henderson, who was a dear friend, told me that she never read her reviews. And in fact, the thing that kind of put her on the map was a Broadway musical called Fanny in, I believe, the early 50s. And it wasn't until somewhere around the 70s or 80s she stumbled across a box that had all of those reviews in them, which she had never read. So, you know, here it was 30, 40 years later, and she's seeing these stellar reviews that she had gotten. And some actors, Jan Minor, who was a dear family friend, who was Madge the Manicurist for Palm Olive Dishwashing Liquid, and who did tons of theater work, was a, a very close friend of my mother's. And she would actually write, if she got a really bad review, she would actually write a letter to the critic after getting this bad review and said, thank you so much. I learned a great deal from your review and I'll try not to do that again. My mother was horrified that Jan would do that. But my mother just sort of read the reviews, the good and the bad, because I've heard many people say, if you believe the good ones, you have to believe the bad ones too. I don't necessarily ascribe to that. I feel that when I'm directing, because I work so closely with the producer and because the box office is important, I need to read them. And also if a critic has said something really damaging about one of my actors or actresses, I need to be prepared to do damage control if they see that review. So I, I'm of two opinions about reading reviews. I understand why some people don't, but I've always, I always wanna know what people are saying myself. Lynn Gardner said that a good critic should try to be a midwife, not a gatekeeper. What do you think she meant by that? Lynn Gardner is a wonderful British critic and a brilliant, brilliant woman. And she was the second string critic for The Guardian in the UK for many, many years and has worked at many other publications. And basically, a midwife is helping to give birth. So I think what Lynn really meant to say and what she, the way I interpret that statement is that a critic is helping to give birth to a play, is helping to shape a play and is helping the audience with their perception of it. Whereas it's very easy for a critic to do what I call the seagull syndrome fly by, shit all over something, and just keep right on going. So, but if a critic is really about nurturing, for instance, let's say it's a young writer's first play, and it's uneven, or it's a, an, a young actor's performance, and it's, it's not all there yet, it's not fully gelled. The way a critic would be a midwife is actually they would be saying, I see what the intention is here. I don't feel like the writer or the actor or the artist entirely succeeded in their vision, but I see what they were intending and I'd love to see what they come up with next. That's a very generous way for a critic to basically be a midwife as Lynn Gardner was saying. I loved a particular comment by Donald Margulies whose interview really blew me away. He said, and I quote here, I firmly believe that in middle age, our childhoods are inescapable. That made me think of your fabulous play, Marilyn, Mom and Me, Luke, which won the 2022 Stanley Award for Drama and will be presented next month in New York at the Emerging Artists Theatre Festival. I've seen the play, and in my opinion, it's definitely headed for Broadway. Congratulations on writing such a brilliant and moving play, Luke. Thank you so much. Now, Marilyn, Mom and Me takes you back to your youth and coming out to your mom. Do you think you'll write more plays incorporating your rather unique childhood experiences? I mean, there's a truckload of great stories from your book just outside the spotlight, don't you think? There are, but as Donald Margulies was saying, I think in middle age, one revisits that at some point. And I sort of feel like at the moment anyway, I sort of feel like been there, done that. I had to write this play. I don't think it was something I could have written earlier than my middle years, my upper middle years. But I feel that 
I've done that and I want to move on to other things. But I feel like, as Donald Margulies was saying, that sort of reflection, the older we get, is something that becomes very important to us all and something that we realize is incredibly unique and special and something that only we can write about. And of course, many writers say, write what you know. Well, writing about one's childhood from that middle-aged perspective, whether it's, oh boy, I was so green back then, or, you know, I wish I had the perspective now that I had when I was 20. I, I think there's a lot of validity in that. And I think that's something that many writers do. Donald Margulies also spoke about the pressures that come with success. He said that once you start getting accolades, people's expectations make writing more difficult. There are more eyes on you and critics compare your works and rank them. Do you talk to your students about how to handle success? I do talk to them about success, but one of the things that Donald Margulies said was that he was very glad he did not have early success as a writer. And I know some actors and some playwrights who have had early success, and then it's very difficult for them. You look at somebody like Edward Albee, who had tremendous success with his first play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Or Tennessee Williams, who had a great deal of success early on and then had more and more of it. But then in later years, with the example of Tennessee Williams, since he hadn't really known failure till about, I'm guessing, somewhere around his fifth or sixth play, it was then incredibly difficult for him. So early success, and David Henry Huang, who wrote uh, M. Butterfly, talks about that too, and how difficult having early success was for him, because as it says in the book, and as you mentioned earlier, then there is a tremendous sense of expectation. And there's also that sense of, so how are you going to top this? And one of the things I talk to my students about a lot is Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, which was an international bestseller as a novel. She talks about the fact that she has this brilliant TED talk about the nature of creativity. And I always show it to my students. And in fact, I have many of them write uh, midterm papers on it. And it, it's about the whole nature of genius. And it's about the fact that she had this breathtaking mammoth success with this novel. And so everyone was like, so how are you gonna top that? As if it's expected of an artist that your next piece of work will top the last one. That isn't always the case. And in fact, it's very rarely the case. Yes, you can have parallel successes like Tennessee Williams or like some of these other writers I mentioned, but the fact that we always expect an artist to outshine their last work puts a tremendous amount of pressure on the artist. And also in many cases, the audience can't help but be disappointed because sometimes an artist will go in a different direction. And as I was saying with Lynn Gardner about being a midwife, sometimes it'll be an experiment that doesn't, doesn't entirely pay off, but sometimes it does. So it's a very individual thing and early success can be a real trap for any kind of artist. David Henry Wong said that career success is the icing on the cake, not the cake itself. That's actually a very profound statement, isn't it? It really is. It really is. And I think I've pretty much addressed that. I mean, of course, we all strive for that kind of success because it leads to other projects and it leads to more work and, and it leads to a better table in restaurants. But even so, it's the icing on the cake and not the cake itself. I want to tell our viewers that the website for Luke Yankee's new book is theartofwritingforthetheater.com. You can also learn more about Luke and all of his work by visiting his website, yankeehillproductions.com. You know, Luke, David Lindsay Abair said that one's entire career is a series of stepping stones. Well, Luke, your stepping stones include acting, directing, producing, teaching, writing plays, and writing books. And with this latest book, you've made a really important contribution to the lexicon of theater education. I wish you the best of luck with the book, and I can't wait to see the next stepping stone that you tackle. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show. 
It's been my great pleasure, Harvey, as it always is. You are amazing and I love you and you're just such a brilliant interviewer and, and such a wonderful man. You, you make it such a pleasure. Thank you. Well, the pleasure was all mine. You're, a, you're just a joy to have on the show and I have a feeling you'll be back. <laughs> From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> Our guest has been playwright, director, author, and educator, Luke Yankee, whose new book, The Art of Writing for the Theater, is now available wherever books are sold. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, and to our team in LA and the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.